everyone, and welcome to my talk on SafeDocs, an update to industry. This talk is all about how PDF, parsing, and cybersecurity overlap. My name is Peter Wyatt, and I'm the Principal Scientist of the PDF Association and the PDF Principal Investigator involved in the SafeDocs program on behalf of the PDF Association. I am also the co-project leader of ISO 32000, the core PDF specification. SafeDocs lies at the intersection of file formats as represented by extant data in the wild, parses as represented by both proprietary and open source implementations across all platforms and devices, and cybersecurity. I believe it has relevance to everyone in the PDF industry and every user of PDF because it seeks to make PDF a provably more secure, trusted and robust technology choice. Formally, SafeDocs is a DARPA-funded fundamental research program that aims to develop novel, verified programming methodologies for building high assurance parsers and new methodologies for comprehending, simplifying, and reducing these formats to their safe, unambiguous, and verification-friendly subsets. You might think of this as safe subsetting. SafeDocs addresses the ambiguity and complexity obstacles that hinder the application of verified programming and formal methods posed by complex electronic data formats such as PDF. PDF was selected as the primary SafeDocs file format due to its ubiquity, its usefulness, its complexity, its evolution and legacy, and rightly or wrongly, its track record. Other formats supporting protocols and streaming data are also in the mix. The PDF Association was selected by DARPA to work on SafeDocs as the industry representative, to bring PDF expertise and knowledge to the various researchers and to help transition wins back into industry. We seek to bring an understanding of the real world of PDF with more than 25 years and billions of legacy files, multiple PDF versions and continual evolution, and a huge number of PDF creators and PDF consumers to the researchers. SafeDocs is currently about 15 months into a three to four year program of fundamental research. And today I'd like to present just some of the early work arising from SafeDocs. Let's begin by looking at interaction between parsers and extant data. As anyone involved with the development of PDF parsers likely knows, what the PDF specs state as shall and should be done and what extant PDFs from the wild actually do can be very different. In SafeDocs terminology, we refer to this as parser permissiveness, where a parser supports deviations from the spec, extensions or malformations, whether intentionally or unintentionally, and often silently and without any user knowledge. Where different parsers give different results, whether this be a rendered image, extracted text or something else, we refer to this as a parser differential. Parser differentials are only sometimes due to parser permissiveness. They also arise from bugs, errors of omission, and differences in understanding of what constitutes correct behavior. Due to end user expectations of PDF and thus business imperatives, this has effectively created a de facto standard of PDF based on the collective behavior of parsers, which is different to that of the official PDF specification. Kapora or test suites have become a key part in understanding a file format and testing parser implementations. Large organizations often have their own private Kapora established over many years from customer issues, but there is no recognized large and diverse public Kapora for PDF. It is also not unusual to hear about development teams using internet searching or the common crawl internet repository to help inform design decisions or test software. By using very large and diverse collections of PDF, SafeDocs hopes to gain a much better understanding of both the de facto PDF standard and what makes a corpus useful. SafeDocs researchers at NASA JPL undertook a study on the effectiveness of internet searches and internet crawl repositories to establish a large scale representative corpus of PDF documents. Their results were presented at the Langsec 2020 conference in the Building a Wide Reach Corpus for Secure Parser Development by Tim Allison. The core findings in this report identified three key points. Firstly, common crawl truncates PDFs at one megabyte. If you require intact files, then they must be re-pulled from the original websites using the cached URL, assuming it is still valid. In the December 2019 crawl, nearly 430,000 PDFs or 22% were truncated. Secondly, determining file types from the web can be problematic as there are multiple competing sources of truth such as HTTP content type headers, the file extension, or file identification. In addition, search engines can further exclude results due to their internal PDF parser limitations, results, filtering, etc. Lastly, not only does common crawl not fully capture a website, 
the different search engines such as Google and Bing can give very different results. For the domain jpl.nasa.gov, Bing reports over 64,000 PDFs, while Google is less than 51,000, with Common Crawl having just seven PDFs in the December 2019 Crawl database. In understanding PARs of permissiveness and PARs of differentials and making robust PARs of it, it is apparent that malformed PDFs are required. But with these limitations of internet searches, can we do better to improve finding all those rusty needles in the haystack that is the internet? At SafeDocs, we recognise that there is data out there that can help. This is this data set of problematic files attached to issue or bug trackers for other PDF parsers. These attachments largely represent unusual and unexpected inputs that have caused issues for those parsers, along with targeted test cases, regression test cases, and other examples which exhibit a far higher occurrence rate of malformations than any normal corpora gathered via normal means, such as internet searching. Internet search engines also do not bother to index into the attachments of these issue trackers. With the assistance of NASA JPL, Apache Sparkler web crawlers were extended to be able to crawl and collate attachment data from the likes of Bugzilla, Jira, and GitHub issue repositories. SafeDocs has now publicly released the first version of a new issue tracker PDF corpus, comprising over 16 gigabytes and 20,000 stressful PDF files for the PDF parsers shown here. We have proven that using this corpus against various other open source parsers has given a much higher ROI, meaning discovery of latent issues, than internet searching alone. Each file in this corpus is also named so that the original bug report and associated developer discussions can be quickly identified, hopefully accelerating your ability to fix those latent defects. Based on the electronic Frontier Foundation's SSL Observatory model, SafeDocs is establishing a PDF observatory which aims to focus a, microsafe, a microscope on an internet-sized corpus of PDFs. The SafeDocs PDF observatory is designed to be an internet-scale, cloud-based system built on top of Amazon Athena, Apache Tika, Elasticsearch, and Kibana that supports instant queries about the PDF syntactic elements, keys and values, if you will, for millions of unique PDF files. It stores and indexes the results from multiple parsers and tools, and so does not solely rely on the behavior of a single technology and its limitations. The current PDF observatory currently has over 550,000 unique PDFs from Common Crawl, including the refetch for those truncated PDFs, the GovDocs One Corpora, which is very well studied, as well as other various smaller corpus collections. Based on just this initial data set and a limited tool set, we can conduct some interesting queries it might be used by a PDF development team when deciding what level of permissiveness to implement or malformations to support. Let's have a look at some examples in action. This is a screenshot of the prototype PDF observatory system. And yes, the current user interface is a little cryptic. In this example, we are doing a case sensitive search for the incorrectly spelt type key. It should be an uppercase T, not lowercase, with results returned in a matter of a few seconds. From the current corpus of approximately 550,000 PDFs, 86 match this criteria. Of course, this may be influenced by the quality of the behind the scenes tools we're using, but given the corpus size and the hit count results, a few PDFs either way will really make no significant difference. I can select different columns to display and even get a quick dr drill down into some data. In this case, the created tool is determined by Apache Tika, and this shows that about one third of the hits are related to a creator called Iris. With the original file name, I can then drill down further into specific examples to examine each file manually. Selecting a few GovDocs PDFs at random, a common theme quickly emerged. There is very clearly a recurring issue in link annotation inline URI action dictionaries. If I go back to Kibana, I can select other fields to show that many of these files were created between 2005 and 2008, according to the PDF file metadata. If these PDFs were critical to business, developers could now make an informed decision about whether or not to support this clearly non-compliant malformation for link annotation inline URI action dictionaries. This is a much more lax and potentially dangerous design decision with much wider implications, such as supporting a lowercase type key in every PDF dictionary. Please don't do this. Even better, developers could reach out to the creators of those PDFs to notify them of their clear mistake. But what about something needing deeper investigation? How efficient can, be, can we be? Remembering that each query and UI change returns to us in just a few seconds. 
Let's look at subtype, incorrectly spelt with camel case and a capital T. An initial search of the incorrect, incorrect subtype key has 8,450 hits from the 550,000 PDFs I am using. The UI shows the proprietary key named ParaXML or ParaLinkXML is very common in the results set as I've highlighted here using my browser find functionality. I should add this is not the correct way to specify second class names in PDF, but putting that to one side. On inspection of a small random selection of these PDFs, I can see that the misspelt subtype key is actually used inside these proprietary para dictionaries. This situation is not an error, it's just breaking convention. So let's exclude all those PDFs that have both the incorrect spelling of subtype key and also a key that starts para. We now get 8,365 hits, or 85 less, across that uh, corpora. And we also have a wide range of creator and producers met, so there is no clear at fault technology. Again, we can do manual investigation of a small selection of PDFs. By doing this, we can quickly see that occurrences appear to be in either the OCG usage dictionary, creator info key value from table 100 in ISO 32000 part two, or OCG usage dictionary page element key, also from table 100 in ISO 32000 part two. And based on examination of more samples, the first case appears to have some correlation with the ESRI creator metadata, although the second case does not seem to have this correlation. Regardless, what we have learned has been very quick across a corpus of over half a million PDFs. Now let's move to something more insidious that could make uh, visual differences, the kind of thing that customers report very quickly. Take for example, the black is one Boolean key in the optional parameters dictionary for the CCITT fax decode filter. Some developers may be aware that this key is sometimes misspelled using a lowercase l instead of an uppercase i. In this case, I've used a different font to try and highlight this visually subtle but critically important difference. The Kibana UI does not use this font, so please trust that I type this correctly. In this case, we have 47 PDFs with the bad spelling and 4,379 hits with the correct spelling out of the 550,000. So the incorrect spelling occurs roughly 10% of the time, but the key is present in less than 1% of all files in this half million corpus. Again, there's no clearly identified creator or producer at fault based on the metadata. Here are some more examples of what you can discover very quickly with the SafeDocs PDF Observatory. These are all extensions or deviation described in legacy Adobe PDF specification documents or old blog posts with hit counts from the 550,000 PDF documents. In particular, the last example is what I've called a Cabana whack, much like a Google whack where we've had precisely one example PDF exhibiting this old and obviously very rare feature. In the future, the SafeDocs PDF Observatory will hopefully scale up to include many more PDFs from many more sources, including the new issue tracker corpus and those not discoverable via normal internet searching. The SafeDocs goal is to achieve 10 to the power eight or 10 to the 10 documents. The behind the scenes tooling will also be improved to support a broader range and more in-depth technical queries and the usability and user interface improved. In the midterm, we hope that the PDF observatory can also be made public. So far, we have been looking at extant data and a PDF observatory, which enables us to easily and rapidly gain insights across very large volumes of files. But these insights are informed by our ability to comprehend the specifications that define all aspects of PDF. So let us now turn our attention to the official PDF specification, ISO 32000. The SafeDocs approach also needs to understand how formats are formally specified, so work was done to examine the latest ISO 32000 part two publication. As you would appreciate, the official PDF specification is a very large document, almost 1000 pages, written by a committee in imprecise English with all the nuances, ambiguities, mistakes, etc., that that implies. All ISO documents and many other kinds of standards for that matter, identify two kinds of references, normative references, and bibliographic or informative references. Bibliographic references provide general background information and do not introduce technical requirements. PDF2 makes direct normative reference to 80 other technical publications, ranging from other ISO, IEC and ECMA standards, RFCs and W3C recommendations, Adobe technical notes, etc. A normative reference means that some or all of the requirements in those reference documents 
are also required to understand PDF, if you like, inherited by PDF. Each normatively referenced document can be highly specific to a dated version, an undated reference to the latest edition of a document, or even a family reference to a whole collection of documents. If we then drill into every normative reference of each of these documents, we can start to see a complex tree of technical specifications that fully define everything related to PDF. This is a screenshot of an interactive 3D and v uh, virtual reality visualization that has been prepared for SafeDocs, illustrating the more than 600 normative references on which PDF 2.0 depends. This is based on a structured database of every normative reference that is directly or indirectly referenced by PDF 2.0. It clearly highlights the complexity of PDF and the difficulty in harmonizing and aligning requirements across so many different documents. The color represents the publisher or standards development organization and the lines show dependencies with 32,000 being at the center of this picture. It is a, clearly a very complex spider web of interdependencies that spans many organizations and committees. A single normative reference can be referenced multiple times, which is definitely not a bad thing as it provides consistency. Of more concern is where different versions of the same document are normatively referenced, which creates dreaded ambiguity when implementing. You can clearly see here that Unicode 2, 3.0, 3.0, 3.2, 4.0, and 11.0 are all mentioned in, in these orange boxes. This indicates a potential technical issue to be investigated and resolved. And if you just grab and go with a third party Unicode support library, how can you be sure you have correctly supported the correct Unicode version in all the correct places? But what if there was a machine readable definition of PDF that was directly derived from the specification documents? The benefits and application for a machine readable definition of PDF are wide, ranging from determining differences with extant data and thus identifying the de facto file specification, file validation, parser, code generation, API generation, test case creation, establishing a ground truth for machine learning applications, and from a SafeDocs perspective, formal reasoning about the PDF syntax using theorem provers. The idea of a machine readable definition is not new. For example, back at the PDF Association's technical conference in June 2013, there was a presentation called Validating PDF, DVA and Beyond, which discussed two technical initiatives and an internal ISO ad hoc committee that had been formed at that time. The technical initiatives included the Adobe Dictionary Validation Agent, or DBA, that is still being used today by the pre-flight syntax check feature in Adobe Acrobat, and the Levigio Custom Xtext Grammar. I recommend you watch this presentation on YouTube as it is relevant today as it was more than seven years ago. In the interest of time, I won't delve into all the possible benefits for having a formal representation or machine readable definition of PDF. However, in the intervening years, the benefits and use cases have not changed much, but not much has progressed either, until now. Codenamed the Arlington PDF DOM, SafeDocs has created a specification derived machine readable definition of the PDF 2.0 object model based on the very latest ISO uh, FDIS 32000 Part 2 2020 document. The primary data source for all the tables in the PDF 2.0 spec. It is neutral against all implementations and applicable to both parsers and unparsers. We have encoded just the object model, which is the bulk of the 32000 document, i.e. all the dictionaries and all the arrays. We have not encoded the PDF COS syntax lexical conventions, nor PDF content streams, although this may be future work. We view the specification derived PDF DOM as a written very rarely by very few, read very often by very many grammar. So we have made all design decisions to ensure an extremely low bar for adoption and usage by industry. We did some experiments with DSL systems, domain specific language systems such as Xtest, but this created a heavy burden for usage and forced specific tooling. However, we may still move to this such a system in the future. Currently, the SafeDocs PDF DOM is expressed in tab separated files with one file per distinct PDF object and named appropriately. TSV is also natively supported by GitHub to enable easy online visualization. The columns in each object file list all the keys or array entries, the permitted types for the value, the PDF version when introduced, the PDF version when deprecated, if appropriate, 
whether the key is required or not, requirements for always being a direct object or always being an indirect reference, the default value of one exists, the sets of possible values and linkages to other PDF objects. We have also invented our own declarative internal grammar to express more complex inter and intra object relationships. By way of verifying this Arlington DOM, we've done a comparison with the Adobe DVA grammar and have reported issues back to Adobe. We've also developed various proof of concept applications in Python, C++ and Java, including the ability to check extant data files against the relationships we have captured, internal validation of our own grammar, checking for typos in the data, and conversion to XML and JSON equivalents. As a result of this methodical work, a number of corrections and clarifications have also already been made to the latest PDF 2.0 standard, which is of benefit to everyone, even if you never use the Arlington DOM. Let's begin with a quick look at the files in the Arlington DOM. This is a screen recording of a Linux command prompt. As you can see, there are 505 individual TSV files, all appropriately named. Every file has the same fixed column layout. Using the Linux cut command, which extracts a specific field from each TSV file, we can get a list of all the unique data fields defined, data types defined in the Arlington DOM. The first column are the key names and the second are the column types. But we also know that many keys or array elements permit combinations of data types and here is the comprehensive list of all defined combinations. We use a semicolon separated alphabetically sorted list of those basic types. If we want to know all the conditions for when keys are required, then this is also a simple Linux command for the fifth column. This is also showing our internal custom declarative grammar, which I believe will be understandable by everyone, regardless of whether you develop a PDF writer or unparser in safe docs terminology or a PDF parser. If we repeat the same command on the sixth column, then we get the requirements for when keys must be indirect references or direct objects. Note that we use a spreadsheet convention of uppercase, false and true, so as not to be confused with the PDF true, false, lowercase keywords. Let's drill a bit deeper on which keys must always be direct objects. These keys are related to the file trailer, developer extensions and cross-reference streams. And you can see here also the column and data. We can also drill deeper for keys which must be direct objects, but only under specific conditions. All our internal declarative functions are prefixed with the fn colon prefix. In this case, the answer is file trailer and cross-reference streams when the PDF is encrypted. And thus we can also easily find out the full set of declarative functions we have defined. There is still some work to do in ensuring that we have captured all the inter and intra object relationships in the Arlington DOM. In the coming months, we hope to make the Arlington DOM more widely available by GitHub once we are confident that the core PDF DOM is correct and we've improved our documentation, obviously. And in no way does this replace the need to have the latest PDF 2.0 ISO 32000 part two spec beside each and every developer. Thank you for listening to this deep dive into safe docs. I will now take some questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, we're now take uh, questions and uh, the chat pod is open uh, or the question pod, please put your questions, ask your questions for Peter there. Um, one question I already see here, Peter, is you've, you've identified some issues with normative references for, for PDF. How can this be fixed? Uh, it's very complicated to fix that, as everyone would appreciate, with so many standards bodies involved. Our first step has been to propose um, an automated system for ISO project leaders, at least to be informed when standards they reference uh, get changed on them. Uh, in ISO, this is currently a manual step uh, that requires every project leader of every document to manually check every reference every time they look at it. And as you would appreciate, that is a huge burden. Uh, so myself and, and, and Duff Johnson as project leaders of ISO 32000 have proposed through ANSI uh, a method to improve this and we hope that maybe uh, this will be more widely adopted into other standards bodies to at least make the visibility of these changes uh, more simple to manage. Obviously the actual management 
of the standards themselves is just a complex technology uh, problem. And I think that's further research can be done in safe docs on that topic. All right. Um, I I, go ahead, Peter. I was, just, I was just going to say I should add to everyone that the my um, deck is available in the handout section uh, in the go-to meeting. Uh, oh, sorry, go to webinar panel too. Oh. So when will some of these tools be, be become available? Uh, I thought somebody might ask those questions, so I'll, I'll break this down into two parts. So the first part is the Kibana system or the um, the PDF observatory system. Uh, now that's currently hosted by the NASA JPL team, uh, part of SafeDocs, uh, and we have a, a discussion with them next week about how we might bring this to market, uh, how we might host it, and how we might manage it into the future. Um, it is built on uh, a set of open source technologies. Um, it runs in Amazon Cloud, uh, so I'm hoping that we can bring this in a in a relatively short amount of time forward. And as I did say in my talk, we are also planning on expanding it both the Kapora side and the tooling side and hopefully improve the user interface. And as you probably appreciated just from the screenshots you saw, there will be a need for some documentation as well just to assist uh, people new to Kibana to help them. Uh, but I would hope it'd be a couple of months or maybe early in the new year we can bring something to, to industry at least to try. Uh, now the Arlington DOM, uh, that's a, a separate thing that is actually developed as open source code under the Apache 2 license. Um, at the moment it's only been validated with a few eyeballs and I think it would be really good if we can get some uh, PDF Association members to maybe uh, begin to trial the DOM. Um, I will admit that we're human as much as the people that write the PDF spec are human, so I fully expect that we have made mistakes and it's really a matter of having a few more people look and make sure that uh, we can fix those. Um, that is something relatively easily, I think, that we can make available quickly. Uh, I propose that we'll talk about it with in the next uh, PDF Association board meeting and then work out a way to bring it to industry. It is currently hosted in GitHub, and as I mentioned in my talk, that was one of the design decisions to support TSV files so that even if you don't want to run code or, or anything like that, you can still navigate it quite simply in, uh, in GitHub. Again, I hope that would be by the end of the year. So Peter, you've prepared a poll for this uh, webinar. Would you like me to launch it? Oh, yes, please. Thanks, Duff. Poll is up. So we're very interested in, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, we're very interested in hearing what uh, industry would like and where SafeDocs might, might focus. Um, so obviously expanding the issue tracker corpus, uh, we've already had some feedback on that corpus and already, uh, for example, Patrick mentioned it in his talk uh, earlier this week. Um, and I know from other people that we're getting quite good results uh, with that ROI. In other words, uh, finding those latent defects in existing technologies. So whether we should expand that, uh, making the observatory publicly available, as I discussed in my presentation, and obviously a, a, publicly, uh, a public release of the machine readable Arlington DOM. I should also add that the Arlington DOM is likely, just like the observatory, to uh, evolve over time as we define more uh, internal functions in our internal grammar expressing more relationships. So this is not just a, a completed activity, this is just early work that uh, I believe is useful in industry and we'll be certainly seeking uh, feedback from any early adopters out there. And well, let's have a look at the results. The observatory, okay, well, that's that's great. Yep. So maybe um, as we as we work through that, we might do a, another. Uh, I'll do another presentation, maybe, and, and do a, a deep dive on how to use it. It is a little bit complicated, as I said at the moment, uh, but it is a, just a prototype system, and certainly will work with the experts at NASA JPL to, to hopefully improve the experience. So that's great. Uh, very conscious of time, Duff. So uh, yep. thank you, everyone, for and listening. And if you do have any questions, and I'm also, my email is at the end of the deck, so please do directly reach out to me and I'll uh, try and answer any questions that you might have.